As we gather this morning for our Faith Doing Justice Assembly, sponsored by the Global Education Committee, I would like to begin by offering a prayer from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, which focuses on migrants, refugees, and those who seek safety and asylum. Please stand for the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord Jesus, when you multiplied the loaves and fishes, you provided more than food for the body. You offered us the gift of yourself, the gift which satisfies every hunger and quenches every thirst. Your disciples were filled with fear and doubt, but you poured out your love and compassion on the migrant crowd, welcoming them as sisters and brothers. Lord Jesus, today you call us to welcome the members of God's family who come to our land to escape oppression, poverty, persecution, violence, and war. Like your disciples, we too are filled with fear and doubt and even suspicion. We build barriers in our hearts and in our minds. Lord Jesus, help us by your grace to banish fear from our hearts, that we may embrace each of your children as our own brother and sister. To welcome migrants and refugees with joy and generosity or responding to their many needs. To realize that you call all people to your holy mountain to learn the ways of peace and justice. To share of our abundance as you spread a banquet before us. And to give witness to your love for all people as we celebrate the many gifts they bring. This morning we praise you and give you thanks for the family you have called together from so many people throughout the world. We see in our human family a reflection of the divine unity of you, the one most holy trinity, in whom we make our prayer, Father, <coughs> the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. St. John the Baptist, St. Ignatius Loyola, pray pray please be seated. Vegas. 
Together with Tanya and her son, son-in-law Corrado, Lydia has developed a line of artisanal pastas and all-natural sauces. Lydia's, which is sold at fine food stores nationwide. Lydia is a member of Les Dames de Escoffier and a founding member of Women Chefs and Restaurant Tours. Both are nonprofit organizations of women leaders in the food and hospitality industries. She is also a champion for the United Nations America's Adopt a Future program in support of refugee education. Among the numerous awards and allocates Lydia has earned are seven James Beard Awards and two Emmy Awards. But perhaps her most treasured honor was when she was chosen by Pope Benedict in 2008 and Pope Francis in 2015 to cook for them in their much lauded visits to New York City. What many of you don't know is that besides being a world famous chef, TV host, restaurateur, and author, Lydia is a refugee and immigrant who has lived the American dream. On the other hand, as many of you do know, she's my grandma, and it's an honor for me to present to someone to present to you to someone who I've known since the day I was born, someone who mentors me and allows me to experience the wonders of the world, and someone who makes some of the best meals in the world. My mama, Lydia Bastiana. <laughs> Thank you, Eat Me, that was uh, beautiful. I mean, I've been introduced by many people, but this was really special. So, uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, it's my pleasure. I go back quite a while with Fordham Prep. Joe's, uh, uh, Ethan's father, Joe, went to Fordham Prep. His brother, Ethan. My other children, Jesuits as well, uh, Loyola and so on. So I believe very much in the Jesuit education, and that is uh, because I worked, I worked a lot as a chef, and I always uh, felt that uh, the, okay, that the Jesuits helped me raise my children, and they did, they did a great job. So, continue, and take what you can from here. And what I, what I want to tell you is I want to thank you because I know some of you uh, would, would be at lunch now and you chose to come here. You are our future. And there's nothing more than, uh, uh, that I love than talking, talking, sharing with my grandchildren and with you, life that I experience. And there's no better time maybe than now to tell you about my experience as an immigrant in these hard times. So I was born. In, in a little peninsula that's called Istria. If you look at Italy with the boot, and you look in the right hand side, uh, <coughs> uh, right of Venice, now Italy has 20 regions. That region is Fiumi Venezia Giulia. To the north, it, uh, it borders with Austria. To the east, it borders with now Slovenia. And Istria is a little peninsula that juts into the Adriatic, and then the Dalmatian coast goes down. That was part of Italy. In World War II, of course, Italy did lose the war, and Istria, where I was born, was given by the Paris Treaty in 1947 to the newly formed Communist Yugoslavia. The, there was an exodus of 350,000 ethnic Italians from that area that went back into Italy and on into the world. Uh, my mother was just expecting me. Uh, 1947. It took the Allied forces about three, four years to decide. Even though the war ended in 1944, uh, the Paris Treaty was, was signed in February, I think, 26, 1947. I was born February 21st, 1947. So for my parents, it was a little bit of a difficult time. Where are they going to go with an expecting child? And I had an older brother, and we remained behind the Iron Curtain. Well, once the Iron Curtain went down, Marshal Tito came to rule, and he was, uh, the, the, his liaison with Russia was very tight at that point. Later on, he kind of loosened up, but he was really communist. So as the Iron Curtain went up, the borders were secured, they changed the names, we couldn't speak Italian, we couldn't go to church, we had to take on the communist dogma. My mother was a, uh, is an elementary school teacher. My father was a mechanic, and so it was kind of hard for them to really get, she had to, you see what happens in a lot of countries that are border countries, even today, you speak more than one language. 
you know, the Croatian, the Italian, even the little German, because that area was under the Austrian-Hungarian Empire for a while. So it, it's kind of, you are who you are technically, but the borders switch. Not unlike what's happening today in the world, and why people are really moving on and seeking, seeking uh, a place to, to, to make a home, to be free to worship what they want, what they believe in, and to speak their own language, and to have the freedom to raise their children and educate them in the proper manner. So in 47, the curtains went down, and we were raised in, uh, my parents, the city of Pula was where I was born, now it's Pula, it was Pula, and uh, my, my mother put my brother and I with actually my grandmother, who was a town maybe two kilometers away from Pula, and there maybe as children we had a little bit of, of more freedom. But what was wonderful there is that grandma, because food was scarce, supplied the food for the whole family, not just our family. So we had ducks, we had rabbits, we had goats, we had pigs, we had chickens, and we made our own wine. Grandpa had his own little vineyard, we had uh, a few olive trees, we made our own olive oil. So if I go back to what made me who I am as a professional, was that initial kind of infusion, if you will, with grandma into the reality of raising food, making food, and really tied to nature. I had a great time. We used to milk the goat every morning. That was our breakfast, goat milk. Uh, with some polenta or bread, and that was a breakfast. We made it cold up from there, and so on down the line. Really involved in everything. Every November was the slaughter of the pigs because it was the right time, cool time. Uh, we made the sausages, we made the prosciutto, we made the bacon, and I was involved in all that. In 1956, my parents decided that they needed to move on because they had. Uh, taking my father, my, uh, my father was a mechanic, he had two little trucks. They deemed him a capitalist, took away his truck, and even put him in jail. Uh, at night, I recall, you know, we were at all at night, they came and knocked on the door, dragged him out, and he was imprisoned for uh, about two months. We didn't know whether he was going to come back or not, because not everybody came back. And uh, uh, my parents slowly decided that it was time to move on. So the borders went down. And part of our family was elected in Italy, and part of our family was under communism. My mother decided that we were going to go see our great aunt in Italy, in Trieste. And we, just my mother, my brother, and I got the visa. They didn't give the visa to my father. They kept him as a hostage because they knew if he came, that we would stay there. Uh, we went, you know, we were happy as children. Uh, to visit and whatever, but about two weeks later, just about at the end of our trip so far, at night, big knock on the door, and my mother was crying, my aunt and so on, my father appeared. My father escaped literally the border. He uh, uh, escaped, he was shot at, he had the sniffing dogs. You know, what, what really is vivid in my mind is that he, when, when I saw him at the door and he collapsed, he was all caked in mud. And uh, later, you know, he explained, he said, you know, as I was going uh, through the border, uh, the sniffing dogs were after me, and he saw a puddle of mud, and he rolled himself in mud as to cover his scent. You know, the quick thinking, you know, it's your life that you have it, and he made it. So, you know, here we were in Trieste, uh, I didn't know that we were going to remain there, but our life as refugee or profugee began there. We could have stayed in Italy, but my father didn't have the papers. Our visa was expiring, and he was afraid that we were going to be repatriated, because at that time, the, the, the relationship between the countries was very sensitive. And, uh, you know, if you had any of the people from Yugoslavia, from you had to send them back. So we registered with the police, and they put us in a refugee camp. They had a political refugee camp in Trieste. It was San Saba. San Saba is now a museum, so all of you, if you visit that part of Italy, it's about an hour east of Venice. Uh, San Saba is, is now a museum. It was a political refugee camp where we spent 
two years. Later, I came to find out that that uh, uh, camp or that what is now museum was also a Nazi uh, conservation camp. They would collect uh, the, the, the Jews that were in, in that area and so on. So it was a somber place. It was a place, you know, where people really escape communism, not only from our area, but from Hungary, from Czechoslovakia, from all of the, the really the, the, the hard communist core country in the middle of Europe, if you will. So it was a, a place where not only Italian was spoken, but all languages. There were three floors. There was a big courtyard, and it was a little muddy, a little uh, cement, and uh, families were put in the middle, and a big room, and we each had our own cubicle, lighted by some firewood or some, some sheets or whatever. And we had one beds, there was four of us, and uh, we had to go downstairs online for food. So at 10 years old, I had my little gamelia, like you call them, my little kind of, and I would go online for breakfast. I would go online for lunch and, and dinner. And they, you know, whatever they gave us, we gratefully accepted. And uh, I know that my mother, they also allowed, if anybody wanted an extra ration, that they can come and wash the dishes. And my mother would go in the kitchen, wash the dishes, so that we could have a little extra ration. And they only stayed for two years. And we were lucky we had also some relatives in, in, in Trieste. So on Sundays, once they bedded us out, they found out that we were not communists, that we were not who we really were, we were allowed to go out on Sunday. All controlled, you know, just couldn't walk out. You had to check in, you had to check out. And, uh, and so uh, our stay in, in Trieste, with the sort of relief of having a family, was, was, was bearable, was livable. Uh, I remember, you know, the one thing that, it's, that really kind of still is in my mind, when we first got there, they quarantined you. So as a, as a young 10 year old, quarantine, that means they were close to 40 days in a dark place, they completely derobe you, they lights you supposedly, clean you. Uh, uh, so I was with my mother, and my brother and my father were in another place. And I remember that I had a little, almost like a, a window of, of prison, looking out with the bars, trying to see if I could see my father and my mother, my father and my mother, because I was afraid I would never see them again. You know, when you're young, you're very uh, in, impressive. The family is so important. Uh, uh, to feel that kind of security. In 1958, Dwight Eisenhower was the president of the United States, and he did open the immigration for people fleeing communism. And uh, we were one of the first families uh, that was accepted. Now, we had nobody in America. Uh, so we were helped by the Catholic Relief Services in Europe and the Catholic Charities here in the States. They welcomed us, and it was a, a, a kind of, of parents. They welcomed us with buses, yellow school buses at uh, JFK, where it's now, and uh, it took us to Manhattan, a hotel. Uh, sort of a, the social workers gave us a room and began to work with us and tried to insert us in, in, in the life in America, tried to find a job for my father, tried to find a good place for us to live a job for my mother, and they did. After two months, uh, we had a little home in New Jersey, which they found, and the Catholic Charities with the whole community, and the Italian-American community that was in New Jersey then, they came and helped us. They filled our apartments, they brought chairs, they brought towels, they brought sugar, they brought food. And here we were, you know, just welcomed these people that didn't know us. And our life began in the United States. My brother and I began going to school, and I can remember so vividly, I couldn't wait to be American. I wanted to be American. When I became 18, I was the first, I went right down, and I got my citizenship. Because I said, I want to, sit. I want to make sure that I have a home now, that I can put my roots, that I can feel at home. And I can't tell you, going back and thinking about that, how grateful I am, because there's no place in the world that you can do this, that you can achieve this. And what makes America great, uh, for, I mean, looking at it as a, as a refugee, as a partner, is that America is 
made all different ethnicities, of all different races. And this is what makes America so strong, because we are all American coming with needs to America and settling and being grateful for it. But at the same time, America allows you to be who you are. You can practice your religion, you can speak your language, you can uh, sing your, your native songs. Uh, but no other country, no other country allows you to be who you are like America. And so I think there's no better time than now to kind of, uh, you know, revisit this and see what is really happening and how, uh, you know, I was given this great opportunity. And you can see, you know, came here as 12, went to school, and I worked for a car uh, to achieve. But I was given the opportunity. I was given the opportunity to go to school, to work hard, to take uh, certain, certain leaps of faith, and I had a lot of help along the way, people that believed in what I did. Because, you know, this is not a success that's a sole success. For me, it is a success of our family. My mother, my brother, my father, we, the unification, being together and eating at that table, <laughs> gave me the strength to be who I am, to continue until this day. And certainly, Ethan knows whenever we can, we get together as much as we can around the table, and food is our unifying kind of uh, we share. It. So, you know, as you go on in life, and this is a wonderful age that you have, you know, you're going to face many opportunities, many, 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 many challenges. Uh, think about it. Think about it. Number one, you need to invest in yourself. You need to become the best that you can, because that's what I did, you know. I knew what I wanted to do eventually, and I became, and I still to this day. So you've got to invest in your education, in your human part of you, and be the best that you can. And then you go out there, and you take the challenges, and grow as much as you can, and you'll come up to a point that you will reach a great point of satisfaction of your achievements. And then you have to begin to think, how do I share my achievements? How do I give back? Certainly that's what I feel. How do I give back to the people that didn't have the same opportunities as I did? Because you are the future of America, it's going to be. And it's just wonderful to be able to share with you this. I know I share it with my grandkids and Ethan. I took all the grandkids up and down that camp, up and down all this, the, the, the places that I was as a child, that I played, how I missed uh, grandma when I, was, when I realized that I didn't, I'm not going to go back. I realized I didn't say goodbye to grandma. I didn't say goodbye to my goats. I didn't say goodbye. So it was kind of a, a tug of my emotions. but. I turned it around and I made food my connected, my winning card, if you will. I use food to remain connected with grandma and with that place, and I use food today to remain connected with my businesses, but also with my family and the people that might need me to give back because many gave for me to become who I am. So, um, you know, as you go, the, the, the satisfaction of maybe having reached a place of contentment, having reached a place of business happiness, and then being able to share that and to give to others and take them on, help them on their journey to become as strong and as wonderful and as great as all of you will be, which I am sure. So um, uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity. We, I think I will, we will sit down and we will open it up for questions. So you will have a, an opportunity to ask me any questions you want. So thank you very much for listening.